you have your Bibles this morning, and you would, find 2 Samuel uh, at the close to the beginning of the Bible, as we are going verse by verse through the book of 2 Samuel. A lot of people will ask, not so much here, but, oh, preacher, why do you go verse by verse, book by book? Well, because God knows where He wants us to be when He wants us to be here. And so, if today Chris Houghton was going to talk about praying and being considering how you're going to use your blessings, and I showed up with a sermon saying, be wise with your blessings, you would say, well, Jake, you're trying to make that fit with what Chris had to say. But if you've been here for the last 12 months and heard us go verse by verse through 1 Samuel, and then we started and went verse by verse through 2 Samuel, then you hopefully recognize that a year ago I had no idea that today would be the day that we would talk about praying and giving and doing all those things. And so it is just that when we talk about hard topics or difficult topics, or you're sitting on a seat today and you're saying, how did he know what I'm going through on this day with that sermon, that it's not me. I, I cannot help you but you can know that God knew where you would be today and what you would need to hear. And so as you're finding 2 Samuel, I want to read you some cards because even though we gather together as a church and we worship and we celebrate, there is so much more as well that goes on. And so I always want to read these cards to you to remind you that how you love people matters. Dear Ten Mile Family, Thank you so much for your thoughts and prayers for our family during the loss of my grandma Alice. Though she is missed, we celebrate the time we got to spend with her in her 89 years of life. We thank you for the beautiful lantern that was sent. Also thank you who were able to come and celebrate grandma's life with us. We love and appreciate you all. And that is from the Clark family. Continue to pray for them. Second card I have for you this morning is... And we ask the Lord to shower you with His blessings. Thank you for your thoughts, prayers, and kindness during Pam's passing. We feel your love and God's grace so much during this time. That is from the family of Pam Ellis. I have two more cards today that are a little different. As you know, our kids' ministry sends cards, handwritten cards, to nursing homes, to uh, nurses and doctors and and to servicemen, military men and women. And so I have two cards today that I want to read to you that Melissa gave me. To the children of Ten Mile Baptist Church, I cannot begin to thank you enough for the handprint artwork that you sent for the veterans at the Georgia War Veterans Home. I know that your kindness, care, and prayers will touch the lives of many veterans who are frequently lonely and forgotten. Thank you for partnering with me to bring them the joy of Jesus this Easter. Blessings and joy from Cindy Moran, a proud Marine and Navy mom. The last one is, hello kids. And the mom sent a picture of her daughter by the ship. I want you on behalf of my daughter and the sailors she is working with. Your words of kindness and encouragement will be very much appreciated. I am sending your cards to the sailors today. I have enclosed a photo of my daughter and the team that she works with. They maintain the engines of the F-18 jets. Thank your teachers for showing you how to care and encourage others. And so whether it is those who have lost their life or those who are willing to put their life on the line or those who have served honorably, it is our job to love one another. And so I want to thank you for being a church that cares. I know people say it all the time. Well, I would love to come to Ten Mile, but it's just too big. Right? It's just, it's too big for me. But, well, I want you to know that it is. It's too big for me most of the time. But what it is is more people who have an opportunity to love other people. And so I just want to say thank you this morning. And so today I want to ask you a question. Would you rather be blessed or stressed? I think all of us would say, blessed, right? If you were to say today, and I was to ask you, would you rather be in a time of feast or famine? Most of us would say, feast. And, and looking at most of us, that's the truth, amen? 
Now, I've lost a lot of weight, but I still ain't lost enough weight to button my top button on my collar yet, so I still need some probably more famine. Today, if I was to ask you, would you rather be gifted or not gifted? Right? For my kids, I always prayed, Lord, I want them to be good athletes. But now that I have to deal with other parents, I wish they were not gifted in athletics. Because why? Sports are wonderful, but parents are awful. And I could be the awful parent, by the way. Please don't think that I am opposed to yelling at an official. You shouldn't, but I, I have been known to do it. But this idea of gifts, the blessings of God, it's something that all of us, if we're in our right minds, recognize that we want. We want our children to be blessed. We want our marriage to be blessed. We want our church to be blessed. We want our homes and nation to be blessed. But today I just don't want to talk about spiritual blessings. I want to talk about anything that God has given you that you are successful at, that you are gifted at. You might be able to say, Jake, I am the world's best cooker. Or maybe today you say, Jake, I've got a gift for financial stuff. Or maybe today you're here saying, Jake, I've got a gift of putting up with dumb people. And if you've got that gift, you are thriving right now in the world that we live. But today I want to show you that God is the giver of those gifts. In James, the first chapter, verse 16 and 17, the Bible says, Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren, every good gift... And every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Today, whatever God has blessed you with, you need to recognize that it's God. You say, well, Jake, I I was the fastest kid in third grade. That's a gift that God gave you. You say, well, Jake, you know, I had the highest IQ in my class. That's a gift that God gave you. And you say, well, Jake, it's not a spiritual gift. No, but if God gave it to you, He wants you to use it for His glory. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, the Bible tells us that we have been blessed. We have been given gifts to use them for the good and glory of God. And so if you would stand with me just for the reverence of reading these verses and the respect to God's Word, Then we're going to jump into our text this morning. But 2 Corinthians chapter 9, starting in verse 10, says these words. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed that you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness while you are enriched in everything for all liberality which causes thanksgiving through us to God, for the administration of this service not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also is abounding through many thanksgiving to God. Not only did it meet their needs, but it was able to be shared, and it was bringing God glory. Today I hope that you're blessed, but I want to tell you that you have to be wise with your blessings. Pray with me this morning. Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you that you know where we need to be, when we need to be it. I thank you for the people that you have sent here today, Lord, knowing what they need and what I need. And So, Father, today I pray that you would forgive me of my sin, that you would not allow the flesh and the weakness of who I am to hinder what your spirit is doing in this place today. And so, Lord, we give you all the credit, the praise, the glory, and the honor we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And so if you remember two weeks ago in 2 Samuel chapter 2, uh, the, uh, Abner has set up a false king. David has been crowned king of the one tribe. And so you have two kings in the same nation. And those kings have armies and commanders. And what happens is that the commanders of the armies meet around a pool and they decide to have a competition. If you remember, uh, a battle, a, a kind of a, a, an old school WWE wrestling match. But that turns into 12 on 12 and all 12 of each side. 24 total men die. Well, as you can imagine, when that happens, something stirs up in the armies that are watching this. The military leaders that are watching this. And so a great battle ensues. 
I mean, if you stood by and watched something happen like that to your friends and your family and your brothers in arms, you would be ready to go to war. And I think it's interesting because while we're talking about war and the devastating effects of it and, and to be careful, we're watching it go on in the world that we live. And so the first thing I want to show you this morning about your blessings or your gifts is don't let your gifts bring you down. You say, well, wait a second, Jake, you just talked about blessings and God's goodness and gifts. How many of us have watched people's success destroy them? How many times have we watched that people have become so blessed they forgot their blesser? They're too smart for their own good. They use their charm to deceit people. And that's what we see here in this passage of Scripture. And starting in verse 18, it says, Now the three sons of Zariah were there. Joab, who was the commander of David's army, and Abishai, and Ashel. And Ashel was as fleet as foot as a wild gazelle. Ashel would have been literally an Olympic runner. He was the fastest man in Israel. He ran like a wild animal. This is how much he had been gifted by God. You say, well, Jake, he could have used that for all kinds of things. I guess so. I don't know what you would use it for, but at that day and age, he was. And so as this battle begins in verse 19, so Ashel pursued Abner. So he decides, I'm going after the guy who orchestrated this catastrophe, Abner. And in going, he did not turn to the right hand or to the left from following Abner. You've probably seen a television show or a movie where someone is chasing someone else to do them harm. There would have been a battlefield full of people. So you can imagine Abner is running past swords and spears and people fighting. And here is Ashel following behind him as fast as he can. Then Abner looked behind him and said, Are you Ashel? And he said, I am. And Abner said to him, Turn aside to your right hand or to your left and lay hold of one of the young men and take his armor for yourself. You see, Abner was a skilled military commander. He was a middle-aged man, you might say, who had been through battle and been through war and knew how to fight. And he is saying, Don't pursue me. Don't follow after me. Stop and fight one of these other young guys. As you know anything about youth, it is the fact that you bite off more than you can... Chew. <clears throat> and Abner says, don't, don't do this. But Ashael would not turn aside from following him. So Abner said again to Ashael, turn aside from following me. Why should I strike you to the ground? How could I face your brother Joab? You see, again he warns him, do not pursue me. I do not want to kill you. Why would he not want to kill this man? Because one, he knew something. If he killed a guy's brother, there would be no going back with Joab. There would be no reconciliation. There would be no peace if this war didn't go in their favor. You see, Abner was the ultimate power player in politics. He had orchestrated all of this. He was unlike any other man in Israel, David said. And so he recognizes... I don't want to kill the brother of my enemy. So you would think this man who is gifted, who is so fast, who is fast like an animal, would recognize the threat, but he didn't. However, in verse 23, he refused to turn aside. Therefore Abner struck him in the stomach with the blunt end of the spear, so that the spear came out his back. And he fell down there and died on the spot. So it was that as many as came to the place where Ashael fell down and died, stood still. So I want you to think about this. It doesn't say that the front of the spear killed him. It says the butt of the spear killed him. And so apparently what happened, and this is just the best that we know, as Abner is running away, Ashael is running so fast that he catches up to him and runs through himself. And it kills him. His gift brought him ruin. And this morning you might be saying, Jake, I'm so blessed I would never lose focus of God. I would never lose focus of what God wants for me. 
But what we see here is this man's gift ended his life. You say, well, Jake, I'm not a fast person. It's not an issue for me. Well, there are other ways that this works. Sometimes it's financial blessings. Today, if God has blessed you financially, look up here. Do not believe what the left in America tells you, that you ought to be forced to give it all away, and that you should feel guilty about God's blessing. You should feel guilty about working hard and investing wisely, because that is not biblical. But there is a time when our wealth becomes so important to us that we miss the blessing of God. In Revelations, the second chapter, verse 17, as John is writing to the Laodiceans, the church at Laodicea, he writes these words in Revelations 2, verse 17. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. They had became a lukewarm church that had all the money they needed. And because they had all the money they needed, they didn't think there was a need for prayer. They didn't think there was a need for fasting. They didn't think there was a need for revival. They didn't think there was a need for soul winning. They didn't think there was a need to passionately love Jesus because they had enough. And friends, I tell you, that is the greatest danger I see for us as the church at Ten Mile, is we have enough. We have a beautiful building. It's paid for. We have a wonderful youth program, a wonderful children's program. We have more giving than expenses. We have all of this. But friends, if we don't pursue Jesus, if we are not consumed with the love for the King of kings and Lord of lords, all of this is nothing. But God wants to save lost people. God wants to bring broken marriages and restore them. God wants to heal the sick. God wants to help the hopeless. God wants us to care and love for those going through difficult times. And so sometimes your gifts will be the blessing that God's gave you. But sometimes it's your spirituality that will bring you to ruin. You say, now Jake, you're meddling. That's okay. That doesn't bother me. In Luke chapter 18, Jesus was talking about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Because they thought they were spiritually better than everyone. They knew more Bible verses. They went to church more. They had been in more services. Sometimes people will say, Jake, I've sat through more long sermons than anybody else. That doesn't mean you're spiritual. I've slept through many a sermons in my day. None that I have preached, but that I have listened to. You say, Jake, we've slept through many of yours. I can see you from here. I always want you to know that if you can see me, I can see you. You, all right? But listen to what it says in Luke chapter 18, verse 10. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give tithes of all that I possess. What does it mean to be spiritually prideful and bring yourself to ruin? Sounds like this. I've done great things for God. I've heard it in Bible studies, Sunday school, prayer meetings, and sermons. Look up here. God allowed you to participate. You did nothing. I have done nothing. God saved me by His grace and by His mercy. God brought me to this church through the leadership of my wife wanting to come here. God called me to pastor, and I didn't want to. God laid it on my heart and Brother John's to pastor here, and I didn't want to. And every time I have ever opened up this Word of God to preach, it is all the Spirit of God and the Word of God that works. Friends, if you've led someone to the Lord, if you've prayed for someone who's been sick, if you've given money that's been used for the kingdom of God, God gave you the privilege of joining Him in making an eternal distance. This summer I am going to have the privilege of teaching the fourth grade vacation Bible school class. Um, I don't know if you know this or not, But dealing with you sometimes are older and and are a little more stuck in your ways and a little more 
uh, rigid. It's enjoyable for me to go hang out with the kids. Now, I don't want to go work in the nursery. I don't want to go that kitty, all right? But, uh, but fourth grade, I can do that, right? They can tell me what's wrong. They can take themselves to the bathroom, all right? That, that's a good age, all right? And I don't have any kids in that class, so I don't have to, you know, discipline them. I can just tell them, whatever you want, deal with your parents later. And um, so, but, and I'm looking forward to that. But look up here. It doesn't matter where you've been on the mission field or God has given you the privilege of serving. And if you think you're here today and, well, I've got great skills in teaching the Bible or I've got great skills in, in helping people with their homes or I've got great skills in this or I, friends, you have missed the point. And that spiritual boasting will bring you to ruin. Sometimes it's not just financial. Sometimes it's not spiritual. There are hundreds of examples, but I want to give you one more. Sometimes it's success. One of my favorite Old, Old Testament characters is Elijah. My first Old Testament character that I like the most is Moses and then Elijah. Elijah was a man who God used almost more than anyone in the Old Testament. He had more miracles almost in his ministry than anyone else. He prayed for one time and for three years it didn't rain. One time he was fed by ravens. They literally brought him food. One time he prayed and a jar of flour and a jug of oil did not run out. One time he was a part of the widow's son being resurrected. And one time when he was facing hundreds of prophets of Baal, he prayed and fire came down from heaven and destroyed the sacrifice and destroyed the prophets and the people of Israel turned and, and worshipped God. This man was used by God. But even though after all that success, something happened. And in 1 Kings chapter 19, the Bible says these words. And Ahab told Jezebel, that's the king and queen, all that Elijah had done. Also had he had executed the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So let the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. She says, I'm going to do to you what you did to them. And when he saw that, he arose. And you know what he's going to do, right? He's going to pray. He's going to, he's going to march on. He's going to stand firm and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he prayed that he might die and said, It is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Even through all of his success, he had grown weary, he had been burnt out, and in the moment of trial, he fled. And so today, be careful of the gifts that God has given you. Be thankful for them. Rejoice over them. But don't let them cause you to stumble. Second thing I want to show you this morning is don't let your gifts bring you down, but don't let your passion bring you down. Today I would say that all of us are passionate about something. Now I know they are the most hated team probably in all of college basketball, but I am a huge Duke fan. I love Duke basketball. I know they are rich, entitled, spoiled southern brats, but it does not bother me. I love Duke basketball. Now, I know what you might be saying if you're like me. It's easier to hate Kentucky than Duke, but we won't go there this morning because it's been a rough tournament for you. And so, in Jesus, we'll move on. But, last night as I was reading and I was watching the scores on ESPN because I refused to watch television and they were ahead, and then they were a little closer, and then they were ahead. I'm sitting downstairs. I'm going, yeah, baby, yeah, because no one thought they could win. That's a passion that's probably not that important. But you and I are passionate about something. Maybe you're passionate, hopefully, about your children and your family. And if you are a parent today and you've ever seen your kids wronged <laughs> or your kids mistreated, no matter of what makes sense, Common sense is usually what? Out the window. And so I don't ever blame parents when they do dumb things, when their kids are involved. Because all of us can be that way. 
We can say things and do things and think things and act in ways because our passion drives us. But today God has given you a passion for something. Maybe it's a passion for missions. Maybe it's a passion for soul winning. Maybe it's a passion for prayer ministry. Maybe it's a passion for jail ministry. Maybe it's a passion for who knows what. But don't let your passion bring you down. Look what it says in verse 24. Joab and Abishal also pursued Abner. So everyone stops at this site of where he dies. And as you can imagine, people are saying, I can't believe it. I, I can't imagine it. What has happened? And so his brothers are after him. And the sun was going down when they came to the hill of Amah, which is before Gaia by the road of the wilderness of Gibeon. Now the children of Benjamin gathered together behind Abner and became a unit and took their stand on top of a hill. Then Abner called to Joab and said, Shall the sword devour forever? Do you know that it will be bitter in the latter end? How long will it be then until you tell the people to, re re to return from pursuing their brother? Then Joab said, As God lives, unless you had spoken, surely then by morning all the people would have given up pursuing their brother. So Joab blew a trumpet, and all the people stood still, and did not pursue Israel any more, nor did they fight any more. Then Abner and his men went all night through the plain, crossed over the Jordan, and went through all Bithron, and they came to Mahanam. Now I want you to not miss the significance of this. If you've ever studied military history, especially in this day and age, without tanks and planes, and, and you're using spears, and, and you're using shields, the high ground was vitally important. And so it's no accident that it says that Abner and his men formed a unit on top of the hill. They had retreated to a place where they could fight successfully. Sometimes, friends, when people retreat, it's not because they're running from you. They are running to set you up. And so they pull back, they find the, the high ground, and they are ready for battle. And Joab could have said... I don't care that you have the high ground. I don't care that you have your troops in the right order and the right position. You killed my brother and I am coming up this hill. You've seen that probably if you've ever studied the Civil War and the different battles, especially at Gettysburg and the, uh, the marches across the field into heavily fortified areas that caused great significant loss for the South. Why? Because they had the high ground, they had the hill, they had everything ready, and they withstood the assault. And in this moment, Joab's passion for revenge could have destroyed his army. He could have marched on that position. God might have given the victory. He might not have. We don't know. But what he says is, we're going to stop. You see, sometimes a word of warning, even from your enemy, can be used by God. He says, how long are you going to pursue me? Don't pursue me. And you see, Joab made a decision that his brother didn't. He stopped. And friends, sometimes you can go as hard and as fast and as passionate as you can and end up in a terrible spot. Today, I don't know what that looks like for you. Maybe it's your pursuit of financial success. Maybe it's your pursuit of your kids' hobbies. Maybe it is today it's your pursuit of a better life. But right after in the book of Galatians, the Bible tells us the fruit of the Spirit. We see that it's not just about what God adds to your life that makes you a follower of His. It's also about what He gives you the ability to remove. In Galatians 5 verse 24, the Bible says these words, And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. My desires and the flesh, I have to, as a believer, every day say, God, take it from me. God, take this anger, take this selfishness, take this judgment, take this self-righteousness from me, God. Help me to think and focus on you. And friends, if you will do that, you can see a great victory in your life. I don't know about you, but I want a victory in our marriage. I want a victory in the lives of my children. I want to see spiritual victories for this church. And Proverbs 16 verse 32 says it like this, He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit 
than he who takes a city. Now, I always thought about being a mighty warder, right? Warrior. Most of us want to be like Samson. Most of us want to be strong. Most of us want to be a conqueror. We don't want to be a, a weak person that's always defeated. But what it says in Proverbs is, if you will control your desires and let God rule your heart, you are greater than both. Third and final thing today, because we're out of time, is don't let your gifts bring you down. Don't let your passions bring down. And third and finally, don't let the cost be more than you can stand to pay. Don't let the cost be more than you can stand to pay. Have you ever bought something and got home and thought, man, I did not need that? Most of it's when you go to Kohl's and you use all that Kohl's cash, amen? And you get home and you think, oh, I can't believe I just paid that for that. We bought a 12-passenger van, as you know, a couple of years ago when we had our fifth child because a regular van won't fit our whole family. And at the time, Lucas Jones had just went to work for Tepetillers. My good buddy from school, from youth, from First General Baptist when we were kids, he's not sold a car, I need a van, they got one. Boom. It's the Lord's will. I went out there and Lucas treated us well. He didn't cheat us like a car. No, I'm just kidding. He was a good guy. We bought that van. I got home and realized something. That was more than I've ever paid for a vehicle in my whole life. A used vehicle, by the way. And I can tell you, the last 14 months, I always tell myself, ah, I can't believe I bought that van. At least it has windows so people don't think we're trying to abduct people. But <laughs> we've heard that a time or two. Needless to say, all I had to realize was I could just drive a second vehicle and avoid the headache of being in the vehicle with them, and we could have still made it work. But anyway, over and over again, I tell myself, why did we buy that van? Why did we buy that van? And then we haul everybody else's kids around with us, and I'm thankful that we have that van. But really, I just wanted to tease Lucas with that story. But most of you have probably bought something and thought, I can't believe I paid that much for it. I can't believe I spent that much time doing it. To look back. And friends, today I want to ask you a question. Do you really know what you're willing to pay for the decisions you're making? Listen to what it says in verses 30 through 32. So Joab returned from pursuing Abner. And when he had gathered all the people together, there were missing of David's servants, 19 men in Ashahel. But the servants had struck down of Benjamin and Abner's men, 360 men who died. Then they took up Ashahel and buried him in his father's tomb, which was in Bethlehem. And Joab and his men went all night, and they come to Hebron at daybreak. And so almost 400 men, 380, died in this battle. It was a battle that didn't even have to be fought. It was a war that didn't even have to be waged. But yet, even in all of this, you say, well, 20 is sure better than 360. It probably wasn't if your dad was one of the 20. Or if your son was one of the 20. Or if your brother was one of the 20. You see, what we realize is here, when sin is embraced by Abner, and even though Joab was doing the right thing, the right thing has a cost. Even when you are trying to love your enemies and someone hurts you, it has a cost. Even when you are able to forgive someone who has hurt you, there's still a cost. Even when you're willing to, to go the extra mile or turn the other cheek, there's still a cost. Today you might be saying, Jake, I... Uh, if I can just get enough money in the bank, or if I can just get enough weeks of vacation, or if I can just get that title at work, or if I can just get my degree, or if I can just do these things, then I'll give my life to God. Today, maybe, friends, the cost might be greater than you ever know. Jesus described it like this, and I will close. In Luke chapter 14, And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? Left after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, 
all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? Or else while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. You see, what we see in modern day Christianity is add Jesus, get forgiveness, and live your life just the same. But Jesus says that's not how it is. Jesus says that He stepped out of heaven and lived a perfect life. That He willingly went to the cross. That He allowed them to hang Him there. And that as He hung on that cross, He took the punishment for your sin and for my sin. And that He died bearing those sins and judgment. But yet He arose from the grave. And the Bible tells us that one day, at some point in your life, the Spirit of God will convict you. The Bible says the Holy Spirit was sent into the world to convict us of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And when you realize that you're a sinner, that you are lost and on your way to hell, that's the Spirit of God. He's convicting you of your need for a Savior. That moment is a moment to be thankful for. You say, no, Jake, I want to live how I want to and do what I want to and, and not worry about it. You will on judgment day. But because God loves us, He sent His Spirit to convict us. And so when He convicts us of sin, we have an opportunity to respond by faith, not of works. You can't be baptized and get to heaven by that, you can't take the Lord's Supper to get you to heaven. You can't be a member of a church to get to heaven. You, you can't give enough money to get to heaven. When you fall under conviction, you have to be willing to say, Lord, forgive me. God, I am turning from my sin, from my selfishness, from my life of living for me to you. God, forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart and life as the Lord and Savior of my life, and He will save you immediately. The Bible says, if you call upon the name of the Lord, you shall be saved. But after that, your life is not yours anymore. It's a life of following and serving Jesus, and it's worth it. People say, well, Jake, I don't want to get saved. I can't drink, cuss, swear, chase women, do all these things. I am telling you what God gives you at salvation far outworries the pleasures of sin. The Bible says the pleasure of sin is fading, but the joys of salvation and a life spent following Jesus only get sweeter and sweeter as the days go by. And so today, maybe you're here and you're lost. Today could be the day that you call upon Jesus. Find forgiveness and hope in eternal life. But maybe you're here today and you're a Christian and you've been trying to live one foot in the world and one foot following Jesus. Friends, you can't. Jesus said to be lukewarm is to be spit out of his mouth. But today I want to encourage you to follow him completely. That means God, search me for my sins that are hidden. Lord, search me for those things that shouldn't be in my life. God, help me to love you and to follow you with everything that I have. And he will this morning. And so today, don't let God's gifts and blessings and desires that he's given you bring you to a place where the cost is more than you can bear to pay. If you would stand with us as Jamie comes and Janice comes and we pray. Father, today I pray that your people have heard your word, not from your messenger, but from you. Father, today I thank you for your word that it's always timely and accurate of what we need to hear. Lord, I pray today, God, for the person that's in here that doesn't know you. God, that today during this time of invitation, they'd step out and come. Give them the courage to come, Lord, knowing that if they will confess and repent, Lord, that you will save them. Father, today I pray for that believer that's here that's been kind of backslidden or just going through the motions or God who's just been just kind of just 
just not pursuing you, but just as is. And Lord, maybe it's something totally different today. Or maybe someone has realized they've made an idol of certain blessings you've given them. <clears throat> and today, God, they're ready to give it all back to you. Lord, maybe it's something totally different. Whatever it is today, God, I pray that you would work for your glory and your glory alone. And God, I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.